Inventors find their inspiration in different places. For Al Gross, it was as a nine-year-old on a steamboat trip with his parents. I wanted to see all the different things about the ship and I came close to the radio room and I heard the sound of the wireless and that intrigued me. And the radio operator motioned to me to come in. He sat me on his lap and he put the earphones on my head and I heard the cackle. His parents bought him a crystal radio set and Al began to explore how wireless transmission worked, even building a radio for his family. After high school, Al worked his way through Case School of Applied Science, now part of Case Western Reserve, by taking a job in a radio store. He began experimenting with higher frequencies, and by the mid-1930s, he had developed a prototype walkie-talkie. And I built several, and I gave them to other uh, fellow uh, radio amateurs who worked with me, and I discovered how well they worked, so I knew I had a product. When war broke out in Europe, the Office of Strategic Services, the precursor to the CIA, called Al to demonstrate his technology. They called me to Washington to see the device and also to test it. And uh, from that, they uh, asked me if I would be interested in putting together a system for talking from plane to ground using my walkie-talkie scheme. It's a sugar run box. The walkie-talkie proved indispensable to the war effort, allowing reconnaissance troops to radio key information to airborne units up to 30 miles away. And the enemy did not have countermeasure equipment to interrogate these devices because they had no equipment that would work at this frequency. L's work was later discussed in a secret memorandum to President Franklin Roosevelt. And, I bid and my device night. was listed as uh, one of the most successful operations during World War II. After the war, Gross formed the Citizens Radio Corporation to market a commercial version of his walkie-talkie. He sold them mainly to farmers and the Coast Guard. Then in 1949, he used his wireless radio technology to develop a mobile pager. He speculated the device would be popular with doctors. The doctors wanted to have nothing to do with it because it would disturb their golf game or it would disturb the patient. So it wasn't a success as I thought it would be when it was first introduced, but that changed later. Today there are 45 million pagers in use in the United States alone, but when Dick Tracy cartoonist Chester Gould came to see Al's walkie-talkie and noticed a wrist-sized wireless on his desk, the pager hadn't even been invented yet. He called me after he got back to his office and he asked me, can he use that device for the Dick Tracy wrist radio, which he had in mind. And that's not Al's only bit of infamy. He's the guy who put a radio receiver in Otto Graham's helmet so Coach Paul Brown could send in signals. A technological breakthrough the NFL quickly blew the whistle on. Gross is the owner of more than a dozen patents, though the most potentially lucrative for the radio pager and the cordless telephone expired years before those devices became popular. But Al's just happy his work has benefited others. To invent something for me personally has no value, but to invent something that's useful to other people and society, commerce and industry, that to me is the key element of inventiveness. Even now, at age 82, when you'd think he might want to spend time just relaxing with his wife Ethel, he's still hard at work. He's currently a senior engineer with Orbital Sciences, helping launch satellite systems and mentoring young engineers. Well, the real Al Gross, please stand up. The real Al Gross should stand and take a bow for his inventive spirit, for his contributions to his country, and for a lifetime of work that was ahead of its time. Six, two, even, over, and out.